Hi, I'm up in Vancouver, Canada at the Cambridge House Investment Conference and I'm here with Peter Spina of GoldSeek.com and SilverSeek.com. Uh, he's a regular at these events and uh, he's been in the industry now for quite a few years. Uh, why don't you tell us how you got started and the reasons that you got into this? Sure, um, I started the websites back in 95 after starting to get uh, interested in the gold and silver markets. A big influence for me were my parents uh, having come from uh, former Czechoslovakia. Uh, they've had uh, quite a bit of experience in what real money is and uh, just understanding that... Uh, and they've probably seen uh, fiat currencies go to zero, right? right? And, and being in a place where you have t two different currencies, a black market currency, the hard currency, and then the local currency which has no value. So they, their understanding of, of what gold and silver is and what money is was a big influence in me, uh, understanding uh, what, why we should be valuing gold. And, and then just understanding in the mid-90s, uh, we thought that gold and silver was quite undervalued because of the deficits and, and the supply issues, uh, which you know, everything has been compounded over the years now. Yeah, it's an even greater opportunity now, I think, though. Yes. Yeah, back then, the issues were definitely not as big as they are now. Back then, Kind of ideas. Well, gold might go to about a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars an ounce, and now it's uh, considering all the money that they they've, they've created currency. and currency they've created. <laughs> yes, and yeah. the size of the debt and and the issues at hand and the global debt issues. It's 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 magnitudes and magnitudes uh, worse, and nothing's been resolved. They just continue to uh, uh, make a bigger problem. So, yeah, I I believe that uh, now the political risk is higher than ever, and. Uh, uh, the world just keeps on digging a bigger hole, and uh, the bigger that hole gets, the higher gold and silver are eventually going to go. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and it, it's it's it very interesting to see that the Western investor doesn't really understand. Yeah, really, maybe they haven't really had a history with gold and silver. The the, the recent generations, they just don't have the education of, of what gold and silver is as money, or what money really is. And I think maybe with Bitcoin, it's kind of helped a little bit. More people starting to be questioning what Bitcoin is and what money is, and why Bitcoin uh, yeah. is in it. So that that's been an interesting phenomenon. But still, uh, the understanding of gold and silver and its, its role as money is is not well understood. Um, so you uh, your site. Uh, dwells a lot on mining stocks, right? Yeah, we cover the the, finan the financial sector, the monetary uh, issues at hand, uh, the current gold and silver markets, but we do have a focus on mining companies. I uh, started off investing in mining companies in the mid-90s and uh, have have done well and, and also not well at certain periods. There's been a lot of cycles along the way, but overall mm -hmm. uh, we've had some pretty big winners along the way. Tell me more about your parents and uh, the background and uh, how uh, all of the things that they went through sort of reflect on what's happening today. So my parents left in 68, 69 from Czechoslovakia uh, because of the Russian invasion and the lack of freedoms and opportunities. And so they came to the United States, which provided incredible amount of opportunities for them, and they've had a really good life here. But uh, now they see a lot of similarities what happened under communism happening here. And they're, they're amazed to see that in, say, Czech Republic today, you have almost more freedoms and more liberties in a former communist country that you have in the United States. Uh, so the, it, it's, uh, it, times are changing, and I think you know, with their background, they understand what these freedoms are, how valuable they are, that you really have to fight for them. And, and then the current generations here don't really understand or appreciate um, you know, how, how amazing it is to have those freedoms and liberties and, and giving them away like we are right now. Uh, it's, it's something, uh, hopefully the trend is, doesn't continue, but right now it yeah, is. Yeah, that's one of the things that is, uh, you know, I'm not really afraid of what is the, the future, but uh, this is one of the things that really does upset me. And, and it's one of the things that we're trying to change with hidden secrets of money and, and such. Uh, if we can influence the way that people vote, because people want to vote for free stuff, and the free stuff isn't free. What it costs them is, uh, is, is a corrupt monetary system that creates a whole bunch of problems, and losses of freedom. Every time they vote for the government to do something for them, they're also voting for less freedom, Absolutely. and they don't realize it. Right. Right, and understanding how mo the monetary system plays a key role in, in being free and having liberty. Yes. I, I don't, it, it's not taught in school, so it's, it's not a surprise that most uh, people don't understand what it is. So uh, it's, it's really up to the individual to take action and to understand that and 
make actions, take actions for their own safety and their own protection because the government's not going to be there to take care of you if they, they have, you know, they're bankrupt. So. Right. And people don't realize that all governments are bankrupt. A government can only provide things for people by stealing them from somebody else. Uh, whether it's through currency creation, which steals equally from all of us as it dilutes the purchasing power of the currency and causes inflation, or whether it's through taxing one class of people to give to another class of people. The government can only provide things through theft. Yeah. Yes, that nothing that they they have is their own. They've had, that's right. They've taken from somebody else. Right. And and by prohibiting and, and taking away the incentive for individuals to produce and, and produce wealth and yes. taking it away, eventually it takes away the incentive and, and things like in, under communism things fell apart. No one had any incentive to do anything. And we're going down that road today where we punish success and we reward failure. Mm. Uh, we make it easier for, it's, it's very, very difficult to, for somebody to start a business these, these days and run a business without having to fight all the time uh, regulation and uh, uh, all the accounting that it takes and, and uh, uh, they're passing so many laws that after a while we're going to get into a situation where if you obey one law you're breaking another and if you obey that one you're breaking this one. Yeah. So they're making it so that uh, everybody is a criminal, all I have to do is decide to prosecute somebody and so the government will always have something on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we've, we've tried this so many times throughout history uh, where uh, it's, it's very altruistic. Communism is a noble ideal uh, to all share the wealth. Where, well, who, who creates the wealth that we're yeah. going to share? <laughs> <laughs> and if there's uh, one sector creating it, why should they share it with the, the sector that doesn't want to create it and just wants to uh, sponge off of it? Right. So. And, and we've shown how, how efficient free markets are in determining what supply and demand and what prices yes. should be. And we're destroying that constantly. And it starts with the Federal Reserve and, and any uh, central bank trying to manipulate the uh, interest rates, the cost of, of currency. Uh, that destroys price information. Right. Uh, across the economy and to and me, distorts things. It's amazing that you take a small group of individuals who meets behind closed doors to determine right. what the interest rate should be, what the monetary policy should be, and they have such great influence uh, in, in, in the global economy. It's, yeah. it, it really is, it, it, there is no free markets anymore. The only monetary policy that there should be is to have no monetary policy. Yes, I like that. Yeah, let the free market decide. So. That's about it. We're going to wrap this up now up here in beautiful Vancouver. It's a wonderful day. Wish you were here. Oh. <laughs> That's a great outtake.